มุทธสาปกวัตถวรหัตุสัมมาสัมพุทธัสสะนมุทธสาปกวัตถวรหัตุสัมมาสัมพุทธัสสะนมุทธสาปกวัตถวรหัตุสัมมาสัมพุทธัสสะพุทธังธรรมังสังฆังนมัสสามีบริสิ่งส์ทูโอ Makes me very happy to see so many people giving up their time at this busy time, Chinese New Year, when I'm sure you also have family commitments. But you're giving up your time to come and practice some dhamma for the day. A very auspicious, good way to begin the new year. The uh, They talk about Buddhism. Sometimes they compare it to a tree. So we, when you look at a tree, what do you see? Well, you always see the outside first. You see the the bark of the trunk and the leaves and the twigs. <coughs> But a tree is more than that. You take off the bark, and then you have what they call the sap wood, which is like. That part of the wood that is pulpy, moist, that brings the moisture up from the earth with the nutrients and feeds the whole tree while the tree is alive. And then in the center you have the heartwood, the hard bit that when you cut a tree down, you know that's the the main central part of the wood that gives it strength. So all those three parts are important. Because if you didn't have the heart wood, the tree would collapse. And if you didn't have the sap wood, the tree wouldn't get any moisture or nutrition. And if you didn't have the bark, the rest wouldn't be protected from the elements or from bugs and things like that. So when you look at a tree, you realize you know there's there's more to it just than the initial appearance of that tree. And Buddhism is much the same. If you're brand new to Buddhism, then you may look at the outside and you say, "Oh, it seems to be lots of rituals and ceremonies, chanting, strange words." If you don't know the Pali language, you know what are the monks chanting? What does it mean? Oh, different rituals and ceremonies that you're not quite sure what it what's happening, or you see statues and. Monks in robes and hear people chanting, offerings being made, even dhamma talk sometimes can seem quite complex or hard to understand for the newcomer. <clears throat> um, but you have to remember, there's many layers to Buddhism, and that each one of them is important. You know, sometimes people work from the inside out, so like. Somebody I was talking to yesterday had come to Buddhism by practicing secular mindfulness, and they were interested in the practice of mindfulness, but they didn't know much about Buddhist texts, Buddhist rituals and ceremonies. So they'd gone straight to the heartwood part of Buddhism. Other people come in following maybe their family, friends, and traditions, and they start with the outside, the bark. Um, And、the important thing is to remember that Buddhism, you know, the practice of Buddhism, depends on all three things: the bark, the sap, and the hardwood inside. <clears throat> and today, you could say we're taking a bit of time just to bring our attention inwards, cultivating mindfulness, meditation, but also investigating and contemplating <coughs> the teachings. So we're coming inwards through the bark, through the sapwood, right to the heart. That's our aim, and we need to do that sometimes, so that we can understand better what the Buddha was teaching.、Um, it's natural we often remain on the more superficial level of practice. We we come to a place like、uh, Nibbana Dhamma Rakita. We hear a talk, make some offerings. And that's good. That's important. 
but maybe we don't really get through to the heartwood yet. If we haven't practiced any meditation or really look closely at our own experience in our own body and mind. Maybe uh, if our experience remains on the outside, on this superficial level, it can bring us some happiness, some knowledge. We can make some merit, make some good karma. But maybe it's not enough yet to really change our heart for the better, change our attitude, change our view. To do that, we also need to bring our mind and our attention inwards. And that's why meditation and the qualities you're developing in meditation are so central to the Buddhist teaching. So as we know, when you're practicing meditation like we are today, this morning, you, know, you sit down or you may be walking meditation and you're consciously, deliberately bringing your attention inwards to yourself. Why do we do that? Well, because our habit as human beings is we're always sending our mind outwards to the world, thinking about our jobs, our families, what's going on in the world, <clears throat> receiving information, uh, looking at things, smelling, tasting, touching things, thinking about things. And we often miss the truth about this body and this mind that's sitting right here. So that's why you know these occasions where we come together to do some meditation, be a bit quieter, <coughs> turn, <coughs> turn our attention inwards is so important. My teacher, Ajahn Chah, sometimes he'd say the practice of Buddhism is really about just learning about your own body and mind as it is. That's where the truth becomes apparent. And that's like the heartwood of the Buddhist teachings. You know, the, the ceremonies, the rituals, the Dhamma talks are all important. They're, 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 they're very helpful as well, but they're really bringing us to the point where we can turn and look at our own body and mind and get, get to see what's there. Why is that important? Because that's where our stress and suffering arises. You know, again, when we're work, thinking or looking at the world on the more superficial external level, we often think, if I'm stressed, I'm suffering, it's out there somewhere because of some person or some situation, something out there far away. But actually the Buddha is saying, if you look more closely, stress and suffering arises internally in your heart, in your mind. And you you have to learn about that. And that's why we're learning to turn our attention inwards. Um, and, and that's something we have to practice. We, sometimes we, we have a natural ability to turn our attention, watch ourselves, watch our thoughts, our feelings, this body. <clears throat> but sometimes we completely miss the point, don't we? <laughs> and we, we get caught up in the world, and that's usually when we're starting to feel stressed, unhappy about things, confused, worried. All the different kinds of uh, stress and suffering we can have is when our mind goes out and gets tangled up in the world. So often people find when they come to a place like this, do some meditation, and it could be at home, could be here, they're changing their perspective and they're starting to look more closely at themselves as a human being, this body, this mind, and, and starting to reveal some truths to themselves about the way things are. <clears throat> and when I say truth, I don't just mean you know, the truth that you read in a book or hear the words of some teacher. I mean actually seeing for yourself the nature or the truth about your own body and mind. <clears throat> and that's why meditation is so important. Because it's helping you to get right through to the, the heartwood of the tree and really understand where, where um, the heartwood is and how important it is. We have to know our own mind in order to free ourselves from suffering. It's not enough just to remember the teachings, say, or do the rituals, do the ceremonies. 
Yeah, as I said, they have a role to play. They're not wrong, but sometimes we have to also give up the time to really develop inner, the inner quality of awareness, knowing when we say sati, mindfulness. And that's what we're here for today, a day of mindfulness. <coughs> when we say Dhamma practice, what, this is often what we mean, is bringing the mind to the Dhamma. And in order to know the Dhamma or the truth, we have to bring up this quality of mindfulness and pay attention. It's not simply uh, remembering you know, words from a book or a teacher, even though those can be useful, a useful part of the practice. We also have to be able to look and observe from our experience what's going on. So you, you probably have heard or read the Dhamma Chakra Sutta, the first teaching that the Buddha gave. And one of the phrases that he said was that when he practiced the Dhamma, realized the Dhamma, it's like vision arose. You know, wisdom arose, vision arose, his mind brightened up. Because he learned to turn attention inwards and understand clearly where his stress and suffering came from and cleared away a lot of wrong thinking, delusions, misunderstandings about life. Hopefully that's something we can all do today. <clears throat> but we, to do that, we have to learn to look, take the time to look and understand from our own experience. So how do we do that? Well, we usually begin by giving you different meditation techniques. Most teachers will, they'll say, ah, when we begin our meditation, maybe we use the breath, the breathing, as a way to develop this quality of mindful awareness, knowing. But there are many other meditation techniques you can use. So it's not that uh, one is better than the other. But usually we say, why not try the breath first? Because everybody has breath. <laughs> <coughs> if you don't have breath, that must mean you're dead. <laughs> and you're, you, none of you look dead yet, so I'm sure you're all breathing. <laughs> So it just makes sense. It's something that was very um, practical, very accessible. It's a way to use, use our mind to, to train in mindfulness by paying attention to the breath. We know the breath is kind of synonymous with life. It's the same as being alive, is having breath. But most of the time, if we're honest, we don't really notice our breath, do we? We don't think about it, we don't pay attention to it, we don't use it as a way to develop mindfulness. You know, we're breathing all day, all night, but so little of the time do we actually notice the breath. So today that's already one thing you'll be doing a bit differently than normal. You're actually turning your attention inwards to be aware of your own breath, at least for periods of time. I remember Ajahn Chah once gave a talk about this and he said mm, before he was uh, practicing meditation <clears throat> he never had a problem with his breathing. It just happens. It's automatic, isn't it? You, know, you, you breathe every day since the day you were born till now you've breathed in and out every day. Occasionally we get coughs and colds or some kind of a health problem and breathing is difficult, but normally it just goes on very easily. And Ajahn Chah said, but then the day he started practicing meditation, putting his attention on the breath, is as though the breath suddenly became a big problem. <laughs> and he said, where is the breath? He's got to find it and then he's got to pay attention to it and the mind didn't want to settle down and be with the breath. And then sometimes he was trying to control his breath and make it very long, sometimes make it short faster, slower. He said as soon as he started practicing meditation on the breath, it became a problem. <laughs> and that, that's one of, our, one of our challenges when we, we, we come to practice Buddhism, not just hearing about it, hearing a talk, but actually looking and learning from our own experience. 
we're so used to th thinking about everything and attaching to our thoughts and our feelings and this body and this mind with this sense of self that even something as simple and ordinary as the breath can become a problem <clears throat> and you may even notice that today you know i might give the instruction today today we're going to practice mindfulness of breathing put your attention on the feeling of the in-breath and the out-breath and straight away you'll start thinking about it or you think oh where is my breath why is my breath so coarse or fast or slow or long or short and, or where is it i can't find it what's happened to my breath uh just a couple of days ago in, I was in Thailand and someone said, I've been practicing breath meditation and every time I put my attention on the breath, the breath becomes so subtle that I can't feel it anymore. And then I worry that I'm going to die because I can't feel my breath and then I feel stressed. So I'm getting stressed from my meditation. So this is what happens. Even something as ordinary as watching the breath becomes a problem. Why does it become a problem? because of our mind that's not yet trained <clears throat> and our habit is we tend to attach to things and react to things so sometimes I, I'll say oh now is the time sit there watch your breath <laughs> and you'll you'll say I'm going to do that but then straight away your mind might form an opinion I like my breath today I have a very good kind of breath beautiful breath peaceful breath or I don't like my breath, or it's too coarse, too fast, or you know, my breath is really a good kind of breath, superior kind of breath, well-developed breath, or it's a very bad breath, or I have some lung problem. Or... As soon as you put attention on the breath, you'll start thinking about it, and you're no longer with the breath. You're now with your thoughts, your opinions, just about the breath. Or more likely, you probably start thinking about something else. You know, what? other other issues in your life what happened last week what's going to happen next week what you'll have for Chinese New Year dinner tonight <laughs> whatever you know, straight away your mind will not be with the breath it will be with its views opinions memories thoughts and that's the challenge and that's why we have to come and practice and the Buddha said basically the more we do this the better for us but it's not easy, of course, it's challenging. We have to learn, we have to learn how to relax a bit. Often that's one of the first things you have to learn in practicing meditation. You, the monk says, practice watching the breath, bring up awareness of the breath, and we maybe get tense, because we're trying to find the breath, stick with the breath. So some people get so tense, they squash their mind onto the end of their nose, and they kind of, within a few minutes, they've got a headache or they grit their teeth. One person, once they were meditating, they're gritting their teeth so hard, they had to go and see a doctor after. Because they hurt, them, hurt their mouth. Uh, so one danger is we try too hard, and we've got to be with the breath, and then we put too much effort into the, to the point where we actually agitate ourselves or feel pain, feel uncomfortable. Or we tend to the other extreme, we tend to be too relaxed and you know you're with the breath for about two seconds and then drifting off catching up with the sleep from the week that's passed that you didn't get enough sleep last week working too hard so now is the time you'll get your extra sleep and sit there falling asleep you know, we've all we've all been there we've all had that experience but it tends to be moving between these two things isn't it we either try too hard and start to feel a bit tense or too little and we start to our mind wanders around and then starts to feel sleepy so that's another part of the practice learning to find what is the right level of effort how to put attention on the breath without forcing it but without being so gentle that we just fall asleep so there's already just a simple task of paying attention to your breath brings up all these different reactions, problems, different experiences. We, we form opinions about our breath. 
we try too hard, we, we don't try hard enough. But that's you becoming aware of your own mind in this situation of, of using the breath as a way to train. It makes you aware of yourself. And of course, many other things will come up. You're trying to watch the breath, and then you have some memory about things that happened you know, last week or in the past, some good things, and those memories make you feel happy. Some unpleasant things, you know, unpleasant memories come up about problems with other people or worries about some health issue or some bad experience you had. These will come up quite automatically because it's these are things you've attached to before and now your mind is calming down, turning to the breath, well, they kind of filter up. Or, as I said, you may fall into thoughts about what you're going to do next, next week, especially if you start to get a little bit bored, because the breath can be, at first, can be quite boring. If you're used to endlessly stimulating yourself with conversation, mobile phone, computer, entertainment, work, food, all the other things we do in life, when you come to watch the breath, your mind easily becomes quite dull and bored. And so looking for something, the next thing to stimulate it or be interested in. So that's another problem. We have pleasant and unpleasant memories coming up. We can feel bored. We can have automatic kind of thoughts about the future, what's going to happen next. So sometimes you you're determined to meditate on the breath and the very last thing you actually know anything about is the breath. <laughs> and everything else will come up, distracting you, challenging you, confusing you. So one of the qualities you really need when you do this meditation practice is patience. Patience and then some goodwill, a good attitude. Goodwill for yourself. You have to say, mm, today I want to do something good for myself. Chinese New Year, why not? I'm going to make, uh, <clears throat> do something, give myself a treat. I'm going to practice mindfulness, see if I can improve my mindfulness for Chinese New Year. <coughs> and you, if you have that good attitude that you're doing something that's genuinely helpful to yourself, valuable to yourself, even though it's a little bit challenging, difficult, but you're putting yourself in the right mood to put forth effort, and you're willing to be patient with your mind, the monkey mind that's walking and running all over the place and falling into sleepiness or thinking too much or making a problem out of everything. If you're willing to be with that mind, whatever comes up, you have the good attitude, you have the patience, then you can start putting in this effort and you learn to find a balanced kind of right kind of effort for this practice. Maybe one in a hundred people, they sit down and very quickly their mind becomes very calm and they're with the breath and things go very well. Maybe one in a hundred, I don't know, maybe one in a thousand. I don't think anyone's done statistics on it, but it's a very small minority. Most people, Ordinary people like ourselves, we sit down to do some breath meditation and we are with the breath for a few moments and then the mind is gone and we have to bring it back. And that's the most common experience for meditators. So we have to accept that. Don't judge yourself. Don't say, ah, oh, I'm no good at meditation. I've got no merit. I'm hopeless. That's you know, one, one habit people do fall into is you know, self-criticism self-deprecation, oh, I'm no good, I've got no good karma, no barami, I'm not a good Buddhist, not a good meditator. That's one thing we can do. Uh, or sometimes people become very idealistic. I say, I should, my meditation should be like this. I should already, I've been meditating for half an hour now, I should already have attained jhana. <laughs> <laughs> Some people are very kind of, you know, ambitious, okay. You know, try not to fall into these different traps. Really, all you have to do is be mindful of one breath in, one breath out, and whatever else is coming up, just accept it. 
you know, if you're sleepy, okay, accept that. And I don't mean give in to it and just fall asleep. I mean, accept that you're sleepy and work with it. Or if you're angry, accept that. Or if you have a lot of desire, thinking of things you want, you know, people, food, whatever, okay, accept that. You have a mind full of desire at this moment. Or you're worried about something and the worry comes up. Just accept it. And accepting doesn't mean to say you're giving up on yourself, but you're just saying, okay, that's what I'm experiencing now, but I know it. Because the quality you're aiming for in this practice is just to know your own mind, your body, your mind, as you're sitting here. If there's a bit of pain in your body, fine, just accept it. Uh, I mean, you're allowed to move, so you can move a bit uh, to, to relieve yourself, but you may never completely re remove all the pain. So just accept it, be at peace with it, be at ease with it. Or your mind is thinking too much, just accept that. If you're sleepy, accept that. You've been working hard all week, so naturally you might feel tired. But try to just develop this quality of knowing your body and mind in the present moment without adding anything onto it. That's what you're aiming for. <clears throat> you might say the practice of... Um, Sati, or mindfulness in, in the Buddhist path, is knowing your experience without add-ons, <laughs> <coughs> without extensions, without add-ons, without increasing the problems and the, and the suffering of the mind. You're just knowing what's there. Because once you know, once you're aware, you can clearly know something, then you can understand it better. So even if what comes up as you're meditating is not very pleasant. You have a, you know, an angry thought based on some memory. It comes up and you're sitting there and you realize, oh, I'm full of anger now. Even though you're just sitting quietly meditating, but you've become angry. Just know it. Oh, this is, this is my karma. This is my thought today at this moment. This is what I'm experiencing. So you accept it. You know it. And try and maintain the knowing, the quality of mindfulness or knowing without adding on. So when I say without adding on, what do I mean? I mean, don't create further suffering or further problems out of what you're experiencing. So what's an add-on? So let's say you have a pain in your leg. Okay, you know that, you feel that. The add-on would be, I don't like this pain. Why do I always have pain? And you know, the what we call mental proliferation, <coughs> which takes your mind away from the present moment, away from the breath, and you get caught into a train of thought which usually agitates you and certainly doesn't make you peaceful. That's a very typical thing. You have a painful feeling, so then you start thinking about it negatively. Or you have a memory of something, if it's something you like, well, that's also an add-on. You start thinking, oh, I'd really like more of that, you know, that experience, that thing I got, that place I went to, that happiness I had, I really want more of that. And so you start planning, oh, how can I get more of that, you know, that nice food or that nice thing or meet that person that I really enjoy being with, how can I do that, get that. That's also add-ons. They can be positive, they can be negative. But what we're aiming for actually is just to bring up the quality of knowing the breath as it is and whatever else is coming up, accepting that so that you can see a little bit deeper. This is getting to the, the heartwood of the tree. So you have a thought arise, a reaction to something, but now you're saying, okay, there's this thought, this feeling, this emotion comes up, but. I'm just going to watch it rather than hold on to it, indulge it, get lost in it, adding on to it. I just watch it. And if you can do that or when you can do that, you'll learn about the nature of your mind, the nature of your thoughts, your feelings, and probably something you've already experienced anyway, but you'll probably experience it again today. <clears throat> Everything is impermanent. The Buddha's word is anicca. When you are quiet and you're mindful and you're watching yourself, you'll notice everything arises and passes away. 
all that arises must cease. It's one of the sort of central Buddhist reflections. Everything is impermanent. So you have a thought, I like this, or I don't like that. But whatever that thought is, it arises, passes away. That's its nature. That's what thoughts do. <clears throat> Could be a feeling, so a pleasant feeling, unpleasant feeling, and you might, hopefully you get some pleasant feelings as well, because as you feel, as you become more relaxed, the body and mind settle down. Maybe you actually feel quite pleasant. You might even experience what we call pity and sukha, some rapture, some joy, some happiness as your mind becomes comes calm with the breath but that may also arise and pass away it won't be there all the time <clears throat> memories come and go thoughts come and go even if you are struggling with sleepiness at some point it won't be all day will it you'll fall asleep for a little while and then you wake up and you work to re-establish awareness and you'll notice oh my sleepiness is impermanent too it changes it comes and goes. So you're learning about the nature of your experience, the physical experience of the body and your mental experience, thoughts and feelings and emotions coming and going. <clears throat> and you realize, hmm, that's one thing I can, I can know about all my experience, things arise, anything that arises into consciousness passes away. And you can do that at any time today. You just notice as you watch the breath. One breath in, one breath out. That's also impermanent, isn't it? You don't just breathe in and not breathe out. <laughs> again, that would be death. You, know, you breathe in, you don't breathe out, or you breathe out, you don't breathe in again. That's what happens when you die. Uh, you could do it for a little while. And that's actually one way Ajahn Chah encouraged us to break through the mind when we are really caught up thinking about something and we can't let go. He said, oh, if that happens, just hold your breath for a minute. And when you hold your breath for a minute, you start to worry, oh, when am I going to breathe again? And it cuts through whatever it is that's bothering your mind, brings your attention back to the breath, to the present moment. There's a very simple method to, to cut through when you're overthinking or caught up in some something. <clears throat> but we're learning even one breath in, one breath out is teaching you the Dhamma, teaching you what the Buddha taught. Everything is impermanent. And if you get into the habit of doing that, and then that some of that wisdom and understanding sticks with you, it stays with you. And you can use it at any time. You're in the middle of your busy day. You're going around working or <clears throat> doing some activities or you're just eating your meal or you're going to bed at night or waking up in the morning. You can turn your attention to the breath, <clears throat> bring up the mindfulness, and then you can observe oh, thoughts coming and going, feelings arising, passing away you become much more aware of change. And in, we say this is, this is wisdom, this is an understanding that can really change your whole experience of life, allows you to let go of things. You know, we, we all hear, hear this word letting go. <coughs> Often we're not sure what is letting go or how to let go. Well, sometimes it is a bit kind of lazy. You know, we just say, oh, just let go. Maybe your friend is stressed. You say, oh, just let go. <laughs> and we kind of use it in a very lazy way. But it comes from a very deep, profound understanding that the Buddha had is that when you see the changing nature of your thoughts and feelings, your body, your mind be becomes accustomed to that it notices change it recognizes and can accept change and then you can let go of things that you're holding on to which cause you suffering because they're subject to change if you can see that you know that that allows you to let go so how do how do you do that well say as you're <coughs> practicing today you may have some unpleasant reaction arise in your mind you know you, thinking about something and it making you a bit feel a bit unhappy or angry 
but you bring up the awareness, come back to the breath, and you say, oh, the monk said this is impermanent, this is subject to change, it arises, passes away. It's just a thought that comes and goes. I can see that, I know that. Maybe I just keep my attention here and allow it just to pass away by itself, because that's what it will do anyway. But you do it with mindfulness in that situation, at that moment, and then you're free, aren't you? That thought, that feeling passes away. When you're truly mindful, you can do that. If you're not very mindful, you'll say, oh, just allow it to pass away, and or just let go, and of course it will return. It'll come back and bother you again, maybe. But if you're very mindful, maybe you can do it successfully. And you just say, okay, I have this, this bit of suffering pop up into my mind. What shall I do? I'll just watch, establish mindfulness, and see it's actually impermanent, and allow it to pass away. If you can do that once or twice, your mind starts to get the message, understands how to do it. This can help you at any time in your day, your life, not just here, but any time. It's like you take that away as a bit of wisdom that can help you from here on. And of course, you practice it more as well. We learn how to practice to establish mindfulness, see impermanence, and let go of whatever it is that is causing a suffering that we're holding on to. <clears throat> we probably all know that. We know the experience where we've had some problem in our life, something we want that we're not getting yet, or something's happened to us that we didn't want, but it's happened and we have to deal with it and we feel bad. We all, we all know that. But often we don't know how to deal with it, how to free our mind from suffering in that situation. So. This is a very direct way to do it, learning to use the breath as a way to bring up mindfulness and then reflect on the impermanence of that thought, that feeling, and then let it go by simply maintaining mindfulness and seeing, seeing that it is impermanent. That's its nature. <clears throat> it's actually a, a teaching the Buddha said can, you can apply all the time because Whatever is subject to arising must cease. And whatever is born must die. And whatever begins must end. It's like just a truth of nature. We say Dhamma, this is Dhamma. And you can notice it in so many things and it can help you particularly to free your mind from all kinds of suffering. You know, sometimes when we're suffering, we're feeling bad, you, know, you might have a bit of self-criticism, could be when you're meditating, you say, oh, I'm a bad meditator. But if you establish mindfulness at that very moment, you say, I'm a bad meditator. What does that actually mean? What is that? It's just a thought, isn't it? I am a bad meditator. And then that thought finishes because it's impermanent. It begins, it ends. And then you could say, well, I'm still here. I'm mindful. I'm a bad meditator, but that thought's gone. After the thought is gone, what is there? Well, there's a space, isn't there? There's a little space in your mind where you're seeing, oh, that thought, I'm a bad meditator, or I've got no mindfulness. That's gone. Once it's gone, you say, oh, even that is impermanent. That's knowledge. That's understanding that you can use again and again and again. That's like going through to the heartwood of the tree, the real wisdom seeing the nature of experience. <clears throat> if we only stay on the surface, on the bark, on the superficial or, or external view of things, then we have the thought, I'm a bad meditator or I'm not mindful. <coughs> if we're on the superficial level, we believe that. That's as much as we know. I'm a bad meditator and maybe it leads on to a few more I'm a really bad meditator, or I'm a bad meditator. Every time I meditate, I've got no mindfulness, and you know, I'm the worst meditator in the room, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> if you remain on that superficial level, that's what it is. It's just streams of thoughts, and you might believe and identify with them, and that makes who you are at that, this time, and you start to feel you know, miserable, <laughs> bad, unhappy about your meditation, maybe. But if you can establish mindfulness, you can say, okay, my mindfulness is not best, but 
you just know this thought, whatever thought is arising, I have no mindfulness, and then you let it go. And that's all it is, that's, that's insight into impermanence. Thought arises, thought passes away. When we're meditating, we're learning to break through the kind of superficial appearance of things, which is the level we're normally working on, isn't it? We're always working on the level of our views of things, who we believe we are, who we believe other people are, your know, names and faces and backgrounds and personalities. And this is a, this Buddhist center, India, and you know, I like it, I don't like it, I've been coming here many years, or I'm a newcomer. On the superficial level, you have all those labels and things, the characteristics that we attribute to our experience. But on the inner level, the, tr the level of truth is just another breath in, another breath out, another thought arises, another thought passes away. <clears throat> you know, it's not that there's nothing here, there's a room obviously full of people, we call it NDR, so we understand on that level. But on the deeper level, it's just one breath in, one breath out. And if you close your eyes, everything disappears. <laughs> um, we are aiming to go into this deeper level through practicing mindfulness and bringing our attention inwards and being a bit more in touch with the quietness of the mind and just observing experience as it is, rather than always thinking about it. The Dhamma is like this, the Dhamma is like that. Obviously there's a role for study and discussion and talks, of course, there's a role for all that. But when you come to meditate, what you're really doing is bringing your attention right back into yourself. And you can afford to let everything go, the thoughts, the worries, the feelings, the pleasure and pain, can let them all go and just observe breath going in, breath going out. And that's, you know, you're really coming to see your own mind at that time with no add-ons, no extras, just seeing things as they are moment by moment. That's your aim. And you don't have to judge it as good or bad. It's just, it's like this. When you're mindful, it's just like this. It's a phrase we use a lot in Buddhism. It's just like this or it's just like that. No add-ons. You're thinking a lot. You're not thinking much. You're falling asleep. You're awake. <laughs> no add-ons. You're just knowing your mind, knowing your body and mind in the present moment. That's something we're aiming for today. Um, and just breath by breath. <clears throat> you don't have to aim for being totally peaceful in a state of samadhi by 3 p.m. today. You don't have to put times on it. You just have to know, is the breath going in or the breath going out right now? That's all you have to know at this time. So much of our life we've spent, again, sending our mind out, planning the future. We've got our hopes, our dreams, our ambitions, our plans. Uh, I was talking to one young man this morning. He's got his 15-year plan, and then one of the teachers told him off, 15 years, too long. <laughs> We don't have to go into a 15 year plan. We just go into a one breath in, one breath out plan. Good enough. <laughs> the way of the world is all about plans, isn't it? You know, I'll, I'll finish high school and I'll get my degree and then I'll get my master's and maybe do a PhD or then I'll get my job and then I'll get my promotion and then I'll do that. And then I'll go and become independent, set up my own business, and then I'll do that, and then I'll do this, and then I'll travel there, and then I'll have a family. and then We've got it all worked out in our mind already, but you, you, now is a time for a rest for all that. And it's just one breath in, one breath out. That's all you have to do. But don't forget, that's what brought the Buddha to enlightenment. That's what made a Buddha a Buddha, one breath in, one breath out. So we're just coming up to time now. I've been talking for a little while. Maybe before we finish, you can just do a few minutes of quiet meditation. I'll stop talking. And just have a look at your own mind. Whatever comes up is fine. It's peaceful, it's not, never mind. Just watch, learn from your breath. 
Thank you, Long Po, for your kindness um, in sharing the Dharma teaching and guidance. Let us rejoice by saying uh, Sadhu three times. Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu.